So today is a day of incredible, of a miracle. We are at the end of John. <laughs> yeah, no, we have one more. One more sermon by our pastor James, but this is it. And actually last week, yeah, James and I just decided this week that there was gonna be one more because we can't let it go. It's very hard. It's only been two and a half years that we've been preaching through John. I'm gonna, was it five and a half? I don't think so, Dave. <laughs> you know, but I loved it. Did you love it? I have loved this journey. It has been so fun. And it just, I have, yeah. So I'm just very excited about this. So where we are, I did think we needed a ceremony at the end of it of some kind. I, I don't know what. Flag ceremony, I, I don't know. But today we're in John 20, 21, sorry. And let me just give you a catch up because I have to go back to go forward. So 21 starts out with the disciples behind a locked door in a room together, kind of not knowing what to do. They have just had their savior crucified and they're freaking out. And they don't, they don't, they don't know. They, they're just, they don't know what to do. So as they're sitting there, Peter kind of goes, ah, I'm going to go fishing. And everybody else goes, that sounds like a great idea. So they follow him to go fishing. They fish all night. They catch nothing. So they see a man on the shore. They know it's Jesus. And he invites them like he did when he first met them and said, throw your net off on the other side, just like he did when they first began their journey together. They grab the fish. Peter sees who it is. He jumps out of the boat. He swims to shore. The rest of them row back in. They sit down. They have a meal with Jesus. After this meal is over, Jesus turns to Peter and he asks him a question. Let me pause here for one moment. Because I think we sometimes go past these moments like it's like, well, ah, Jesus, Peter jumped out of the boat. Ah. You know, I'm always looking at the human element when I'm preaching. Because I believe, and I say this all the time, that the Bible is as much about what it means to be a human being on earth as it tells us about God. It is both. It is both and. So... As I'm reading this, I'm thinking to myself, Peter denied Jesus three times. And Peter was what I call a pontificator, right? Love Peter. No one was rebuked. None of the disciples were rebuked as much as Peter is, right, by Jesus. When, you know, when he said, who do you say I am, Peter? You're the, you're the son. Of, you're, the, you're, you're God the son. You're this amazing person. And then Jesus talks about he's going to be crucified, and Peter goes, no, you're not. And Jesus goes, get behind me, Satan. Like, Peter is, re but I also love him because he just puts his foot in his mouth all the time. So you got to love this guy. So he denies Jesus three times. All of the disciples ran. Can we pause right there? I want you to imagine with me you're at the worst time in your life. Maybe you're going to jail. Maybe you're in the midst of a terrible diagnosis. Maybe you are getting a divorce. Maybe you're just in a dark, dark place. And the people that you are depending on that have walked with you for three years, one of them denies you, and you know they do, and all of them run. Can we soak that in? How would you feel? How does that feel? when we are betrayed? How does it feel when we are abandoned? How does it feel when we're left? How do we feel in those moments? You have poured your soul out. Does anyone notice that Jesus doesn't reprimand them? Does anyone notice that he doesn't say, okay, before I share this fish with you, I want you all to line up right now. And I want each one of you to apologize. <laughs> and then, then I'll break bread with you. He doesn't 
do that? See, that's an invitation to us. What do we do when we are betrayed? Because we all are. What do we do when we are hurt? Because it happens to all of us. What do we do when the people we thought were going to be there run, run when we need them? The invitation in these moments is to say, let me forgive you, is to, is to listen to what God is inviting us into in that moment. Because sometimes we do have to separate. Sometimes we do need to walk away. But there is still that invitation from God to walk in that forgiveness, to walk in that love. And I don't know how many of us find it easy to forgive. I think it's one of the hardest things we do, especially when people have left us, especially when we've betrayed. But I want to remind us that unforgiveness is like drinking poison ourselves, expecting the other person to die. That's, it's about us. It really is not about the other person. And as Jesus is sitting here, I'm thinking of Isaiah 53. It says, we all like sheep have gone astray, each one of us going their own way. He knows this about us. He knows how we are. He knew how the disciples are. I think sometimes when we are reading the Bible, we read us as the hero and others as the ones who make the mistake. But I have to tell you, even when we don't mean to, we let people down. We all do it. We all accidentally, and maybe some in this room on purpose, but I'm going to say accidentally, betray without even knowing that we're doing that. Sometimes people feel that we've abandoned them and we don't even know we've done it. We are the ones who we all like sheep have gone astray. We are them. We are those. And I think sometimes when we realize that we are them, it gives us the opportunity to forgive. To forgive because we know that we too could be going down that road. There is a path through when we're betrayed, when we're let down, and when we're abandoned. And I say that because I think sometimes we get so caught in how we feel in those moments. We get so caught in our pain. But there is a, there is a path through. And I want to connect it back to Psalm 91, right? He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest under the shadow of the Almighty. That path through is Jesus. Jesus took the betrayal, the abandonment, the pain of that moment on the cross with him. He bore that. He bore all of what they did to him. He bore that so that we could enter into that relational thing ourselves. So it's such a human thing. So Jesus comes into this scene and he invites them to the table again. He invites them back to the table of fellowship, to the table where he's breaking bread. How many times have they broken bread over those three years? He invites them back to drinking that wine. He invites them back to eating that fish, their sustenance after a long night, of sitting at the table with the one that they ran away from. See, I don't think this was only a reinstatement of Peter. I think it was a reinstatement of them all. I think he said, all of you come to this moment. I think it was a reminder of what grace and forgiveness looks like. I think it was the image of what Jesus did on that cross for them. So Jesus then specifically turns to Peter and says, do you love me more than these? We don't know what more than these are. Like, did he go, do you love me more than these? What was he saying? It's so curious. Nobody knows. There's not even a commentary that I could find anything on. Is it more than his fishing identity? Because Peter returned 
to fishing? Does he say, Peter, do you love me more than this, than what you do here, your fishing? Was he talking about um, the disciples? Do you love me more than these, than, than your relationship with, with the disciples? What was he saying to that? We don't know, but what I do notice about when Peter answers this question is it's the one time he doesn't put his foot in his mouth. And he says to him, you know that I love you. He doesn't say more than these. And I have a theory, doesn't mean I'm right, but my theory is when he's saying, do you love me more than these? And Peter says, you know that I do. It's like he was going, I am not going to say again more than these because I've already told you I wasn't going to deny you, and I did. It's like Peter has come to the other side of being humble, of humility, of being human, of knowing that he screws up. And so he just looks at him and says, you know that I do. You know I love you more than these. There's no hyperbole in his language. He's just humble. And then he reminds Peter of who he is and reinstates him with the vision of what he's called him to do. Feed my sheep, tend my sheep, and feed my sheep again. For me, Jesus is giving Peter his pastoral papers. He is telling him who he is. He is, he is telling him, you are called to my sheep. So I wanted to return to these for a moment before I moved on to my verses, because I really believe that this is a question that God asks every single one of us. He calls us out and he says to us, Taylor, do you love me more than these? And he invites us to answer more than the things you dearly love in your life, more than the things that you might identify with. Do you love me more than these? He comes and whispers into each one of our hearts. James, do you love me more than these? Do you love me, Jen, more than these? Carol, do you love me more than these? Shar, do you love me more than these? He asks each one of us in our life. And from there, he moves on to the second part. And that is feed my, tend my. I don't know what that is for you, but there is not a person on this earth that God does not invite into something, that God does not invite and that you have somebody that God is inviting you to feed and that you have somebody that God is inviting you to tend and that you have your call to whatever that might be. It can be being a clerk at a grocery store. It can be having a political office and changing lives. It can be being a nurse. It can be being an aide. It can be whatever you fill in the blank for. There is not a human being that is not born on this earth that I believe that Jesus doesn't say, Joe, do you love me? that I'm asking you to feed and attend. I think this is a reinstatement for all of us. I think part of the reason that the Bible is put down into these words and we see the humanness of people is so that we can identify and we can say, how does this fit into my life? It's not so I can be a theological, you know, uh, amazing theolo theologian. It's so that we can look and go, how do I live my life in a way that brings glory to God? I don't know what your call is, but I can tell you that until the day you leave this earth, there is something that God is calling you into. There is something for feeding and tending that God is inviting you. And by the way, it doesn't always mean it's going to be easy. James 2 says this, 
Faith by itself, if it does not result in action, is dead. Someone will say, you have faith and I have deeds. But I'm going to tell you, show me your faith without deeds, and I'm going to show you my faith by what I do. There is a call that we all have. There is a sacrifice. Romans 12, in view of God's mercy, offer your bodies as living sacrifices. This is your spiritual act of worship. It's not just, you know, when I got saved, it was like, just get saved so you can get to heaven. Like, that was it. Like, for me, it was like, you know, my insurance policy. Literally, that's how I got saved. I'm like, well, geez, if God is real and I die and there is a hell, and I would, then if God isn't real but I ask Jesus to come into my heart, but it doesn't really matter if he's not, ah, oh, Jesus, come into my heart. Boom. And God being God goes, oh, I got you now, baby. <laughs> but you know, it's not just, yeah, just let's do that and then go and live my life. There is, there is a call and there is a cost. There is an invitation that God invites us into. And first he, he invites us and then he looks at us and he says, do you love me more than the things you have in your life? Do you love me more than these, Tracy? And it's not a one and done answer. It is a day by day, moment by moment answer that he invites us into. And then Peter gets exasperated and he's like, you know that I love you. And here's where we enter into the verses I have today. And it feels a little like a setup. He says, Peter, listen. And this is, um, my goodness, the Passion Translation. Peter, listen. When you were younger, you made your own choices and you went where you pleased. But one day when you're old, others are going to tie you up and escort you where you would cho not choose to go. And you will spread out your arms. And then there's a little parenthetical sentence here that John adds in. Jesus said this to Peter as a prophecy of what kind of death he would die for the glory of God. And then he said, Peter, follow me. This was written three decades, by the way, after. So by the time John wrote this gospel, Peter had already been crucified, and tradition tells us upside down. So John knew what Jesus was saying. Whether John knew at that time when Jesus was saying it to Peter, we have no idea. But he certainly knows it now because he knew Peter was crucified. But the whole conversation to me, here's my human side, people. The whole conversation feels like a setup to me. He looks at Peter and he goes, do you love me? Three times. Peter goes, Lord, you know that I do. And then... Jesus kindly says to Peter, well, that's great, Peter, because you're going to suffer. You're going to go where you don't want to go. People are going to dress you. Let me tell you what it's going to cost you. And then he goes, follow me. I don't know about you, but I'd be like, can I rethink this now in a moment? Ho hold on a minute. Can I just think about what this is? You know, again, for me, this is the antithesis of when I came to know Jesus. First, first thing was insurance policy, right? Then I started going to church. Well, after I started going to church, everything I heard was like, when you know Jesus, everything works out great. <laughs> right? It's gonna, you're going to be happy. You're going to tiptoe through the tulips for the rest of your life playing a ukulele. You're going to be singing and joyous. And look, if something happens, just pray. And if you pray, then everything is going to work out just great. Has anybody found that to be true? Exactly. Exactly. So I thought like Red Seas were going to part. But that's not what happens here. And see, sometimes I'm just a... I, I'm just a realist. I wish somebody would have said to me, Tracy, when you follow Jesus, it doesn't mean that life is going to be great. What it does mean 
is that he will never leave you and he will be with you in every moment. And whatever happens in your life, no matter how ugly it gets, his life will find a way to bring life back to your life. Even when you're in the most harrowing, terrible moments of your life, he will find you and he will restore. He will bring you back. And when you're in that dark place and you feel like there is no way out, there is. His love always finds us. His love always brings us out. But that's not what I was told. So Jesus is looking at Peter and he goes, Peter, do you love me? Yes, I love you. Tend my sheep. And by the way, the very sheep that you're tending are going to crucify you. That would anybody say yes? But Peter does. Peter does. And Peter, you know, I'm the one, as Sandra always says during her sermons, that assigns people their text. And mostly I just put names down and, and don't really, you know, every once in a while, like this one, I purposely gave to Sandra. This one I purposely gave to me. Here's why. It's my favorite verse in the Bible. They're in this intensive moment. He is inviting Peter into something deeper. He's telling him, you're going to be crucified. It's not going to be easy for you. He says, follow me. And Peter goes back to being Peter, and he sees John and goes, what about John? What about John? If I'm going to die, he better die with me. What is he going to do? First off, the other part of it is, was John spying like John and Peter, I've never noticed it until I started preaching this, you know, they got something going on between them. I mean, if there's ever like a commentary, you know, John's always like, you know, the one that Jesus loves, Peter, would be me. The one who put their head on Jesus' shoulder, Peter, me. So like, did John see Jesus and Peter walking off by themselves and he was like meandering with them? You know, like, like I just, they're so human. I, you know, I just was curious. So Peter just goes, what about him? And then, which, don't we all kind of live our life like that? Especially when we're miser miserable. We kind of look around. Who's miserable with me? Anybody? If my life sucks, I want yours to suck too. We're kind of like that. Right? We kind of fall into this comparison trap. But you know, comparison is such a difficult thing. So Jesus looks at, at Peter and he goes, if I decide to let him live until I return, what concern is that of yours? You must keep on following me. Powerful words. What concern is that of yours, you must still keep on following me. Everyone's life is their own. Everyone has their own path. Your path is not my path. And my path is not your path. And your neighbor's path is not your path. And your partner's path is not your path. And your children's path is not your path. You and I have a path. It is our journey. This is where I want to land, the comparison trap. We all compare. Theodore Roosevelt said, Comparison is the thief of joy. Here's some of my research I did on comparison. People constantly evaluate themselves and others in domains like attractiveness, wealth, intelligence, and success. According to some studies, as much as 10% of our thoughts involve comparison of some kind. Social comparison theory is the idea that individuals determine their own social and personal worth 
based on how they stack up against others. And since we now have social media, it is even worse. According to data published, approximately 90% of women state that they compare themselves with other social media users, while this rate is recorded as 65% for men. Nearly 40% of these people have a negative perception of themselves as a result of comparisons. There is a diagnosis that is in the DMV called obsessive comparison disorder. And its symptoms include anxiety, intrusive thoughts, and worry. They're, they constantly compare their life to others and as a result have discontent with their own life. It is so easy to get caught in comparison. More than 75% of respondents to a survey recently assessed their self-worth by comparing themselves to other people and subsequently spent the day in an emotional slump. You know, social media is very interesting to me. It's this love-hate thing that I have. It's such a good way to communicate and stay in touch with people, but it also becomes a cauldron of why do other people's lives look better than mine. I don't spend a lot of time comparing in that realm. I don't, I just don't do that. And let me explain part of the reason why. Because I have connection with a lot, a lot, a lot of people. And I have very deep, intense conversation with people. And I always find it so ironic that I'm having these conversations here and then I see their social media posts and they are two completely different things. And I look at the social media posts and I'm like, that's not what you were just saying to me an hour ago in my office. We, we present ourselves in a way that I just think is not really healthy. And we look at social media in a way that I think is not very healthy. So they do say that comparisons can at times be beneficial, but people who regularly compare themselves may find motivation to improve, but that's short-lived because you also experience feelings of dissatisfaction, guilt, remorse, or you engage in destructive behaviors. Have we all done that, right? You look at somebody, you're like, I want to go on that vacation. I want it. Why do they look so happy? Like, we all do it. Here's an interesting statistic. Reducing social media use by even 30 minutes per day leads to lower levels of anxiety, depression, loneliness, and difficulty with sleep. We all want to know how we're doing. And that's the other thing. They said, because we are relational creatures, comparison is a natural part of our life. It's there. We're going to do it. It is there. But it's how we respond when we're there. It's what we do with it when we're there. So as I said, I don't spend a lot of time comparing. I, at my age, you know, you're like, it is what it is. I'm here. This is what you got, right? You know, you just kind of, here I am except when it comes to pastoring, especially after 2015, after our pastor passed away. I, I used to say to myself, WWBD, what would Bob do? <laughs> so when I entered into the role, I was constantly comparing myself to Bob, to Pastor Bob. We're two different people. So I would measure myself up against what he did, his successes. Or I'd measure myself by other churches. How many people do they have? Every time I meet a pastor and they're like, hi, I'm pastor or whatever from whatever church, immediately the first thing I want to say to him is really how many people you got? <laughs> Can I see your budget? <laughs> how you doing financially? <laughs> right? There's just these questions about, you know, how, do people like you? You know. That realm is still something to this day that can grab me. 
can grab me. I see an event going on at another church. This is what I do, <laughs> telling on myself. I see an event going on at another church, and then I make it big so I can look in the background <laughs> to see who's there. Do I know anybody? Did they used to come here? How many people do they have? One, two, three, four, five. If I multiply that by the size of their church, I will do that, right? I had a friend, Rob Holman, who after Pastor Bob passed away, that man met with me for like three, four years, love him. And he would look at me almost every time we met and go, Tracy, stay in your lane. Stay in your lane. Can you all say stay in your lane? Church, stay in your lane. We all have a lane. We all have a people that we're invited to feed. This is my people. We all, you guys make me cry. We all have people that we are invited to tend. That's our lane. Your lane is not mine. My name is not yours. My lane is not any other church that is in the world. My lane is here, this place. But the journey for each one of us is to tell ourselves, stay in your lane. That's basically what Jesus was saying to Peter. Hey, Peter, stay in your lane. You do what I'm calling you to do, and don't worry about John. Let John be John. You be you. Second Corinthians says, we do not dare to classify or compare ourselves with some of those who commend themselves, because when they measure themselves by one another and compare themselves with one another, I love this, they do not show good sense. It is not good sense to compare. It doesn't help us. It doesn't work. It is not beneficial. We will always find somebody who is better, smarter, cuter, richer than we are. We will always find people that we think are poorer, uglier <laughs> than we are. We will always find that. It's not about that. It is about dwelling in the secret place and allowing God to speak into each one of our lives and staying in our lane. Because pulling it all the way back to the back to where I started, the quintessential question that I believe God asks all of us is, do you love me more than these? Then I'm going to invite you to feed my, tend my, and I'm going to invite you to stay in your lane because you have a call, you have a people, you have a place, you have space in this world, you belong in this world, and you have a call for somebody, for a group. You have a call to enter in to your, what I call your swing. We all got a swing. We all got a space. What is yours? And it comes through dwelling in that secret place of the Most High and listening to what God says. So let me give you the opposite of comparing. The opposite of comparing is embracing. The opposite of comparing is to look at other people's gifts and celebrate. The opposite of comparing is to look at somebody's life and to go, I am happy for you in your life. The opposite of comparing is celebrating and is community and is, what word did you use, James? Almost pack, like a pack, like, a, like an animal pack where everybody works together. The opposite of comparing is to see somebody else's giftedness and to go, I want to support you where you're at. I want to walk with you where you're at because I got my lane and you got your lane and I want to celebrate the lane that you are walking in. 
while I celebrate the lane that I am walking in. Imagine what this world would look like. Because as we were in prayer earlier, we were talking about this culture at least, and I think Western culture is built on competition. It is built on stepping on somebody else so you can get ahead. It is built on winning. That is not the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is celebrating with one another, is embracing what we each have. The kingdom of God is recognizing that each one of us have to answer that question, do you love me more than these? And how you love Jesus is not my business. There's a little saying that I found. Did you know there are two places that you can stay for free? In your own lane and out of my business. <laughs> You know, ask Tony, he'll hear me do this. I'll go, not my business, not my call. I do that all the time. I'll come home and look. He knows how, what kind of a day that I've had when I walk in and I go, not my business, not my call. That's all I got to say about that. I say it all the time. Yeah. Here's another one. Everyone has their own lane. Maintain yours. There's less, less traffic and no speed limit. Imagine what we would do if we spent our time looking at our lane and listening for how God has invited us into our lane. So this morning, as we're going into communion, can, can you grab this? This morning, as we're going into communion, the invitation that I want to give out, as you come up, and as you take these elements, the invitation is this. Can you hear the whisper? Can you hear the whisper of Jesus saying, do you love me more than these? Feed my, tend my, feed my. Can you come up and can we take a moment as we're entering in to the breaking of bread and recognizing the blood of Jesus and what he's done? And can we answer that question, each one of us? Do you love me more than these? And after he says, feed my, tend my, and feed my, he says, follow me. Everybody, everybody get ask, gets asked this question and is invited to follow, don't care how old you are. <laughs>